Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're going to look at Rifle No. 5 Mark I, aka the Jungle Carbine. Jungle Carbine's not really the best name for it, but that's the one that has stuck, so we'll acknowledge it at least. Now, it's going to be a really cool video because I have everything here from one of the very first batch of converted No. 4 Trials rifles, all the way through rifles exhibiting all of the different characteristics, different stocks, different sights, um, and at least one or two cool experimental pieces. So, um, all the way through the number 5 Mark II, which didn't actually exist. So the basic story here is in 1943 the British military undertook a study to determine what kind of new equipment would serve better, particularly in a jungle environment. They're doing a lot of fighting in Southeast Asia against the Japanese, and well, one of the things that came out of this study was the number 4 rifles, kind of long and kind of heavy, and if we had something that was shorter, lighter, and handier, that would be nice. Now there had been work on how to lighten the number 4 previous to this, but this study really kind of focuses uh, development on, okay, let's actually do it. Let's build a separate uh, lightened, shortened carbine version of the, no, the number 4. And that's essentially what they did. They started with number 4s, made a number of modifications, and ultimately came up with the number 5. The first prototypes were developed late in 1943, testing was done through early 1944, it was type classified and formally adopted in September of 1944 as Rifle Number 5 Mark I. They had 50,000 of them already produced by the end of that year, because this is largely the same as the number 4 in terms of the important mechanical bits. And uh, the two factories that manufactured these, which were Fazakerly and BSA Shirley, uh, were both already making number 4s, and they were allowed to produce number 5s to fulfill number 4 rifle contracts. So that's an easy way to get production started. Now let's go ahead and take a look at all the little details here, including some of the developmental changes through the life of the number 5, which is fairly short, because this is probably about the shortest lived uh, service rifle in British military history. Um, once we're done with that, then we'll talk about the, uh, the Wandering Zero issue that is one of the most recognized things about this rifle. We are going to start here with one of the actual Trials guns, which is super cool to be able to show you. So um, what we have fundamentally is a number 4 action. Uh, same magazine, same sight, same stripper clip, same bolt system. Um, what has been changed right in here is simply a matter of lightning. So uh, lightning cuts have been put predominantly in two specific places. We can see this more easily if we flip up the rear sights, but right here the top of the receiver is milled flat, and there's a scalloped cut into the back of the receiver, which is not on the original number 4 back there. So you can see that lightning cut. There is basically a matching cut on the left side of the receiver right here, which is not present on the number 4. If we take the handguard off, and this is a different rifle that I pulled the handguard off to show you with, uh, there are a couple of scalloped cuts on either side of the Knox form on the barrel. Those are again there just to remove weight. And the bolt knob has been cut out hollow. That, that's pretty much it for the mechanical cuts on, on the gun to reduce its weight. However, there are some additional places where weight is saved. The buttstock is just a little bit narrower, a little skinnier than the originals. The barrel has been shortened. Uh, the rifle is about 5 inches shorter than a standard number 4, and so that saves weight. In addition, the stock and the handguards have both been cut back. So this looks like it's sporterized, but this is in fact uh, an authentic, legitimate uh, version of the rifle. It's not the only version, we'll look at the other pattern in a minute. But uh, cutting back on the barrel saved weight, and cutting back on the stock saved more weight. Now a couple of the changes that were made at the same time, one is the addition of this device on the front. This is a front sight block. It is also a conical flash hider, because the same ammunition was being used as in the longer barreled number 4. Uh, because the barrel was shorter, the powder didn't burn quite completely uh, through the number 5 barrel, and so they wanted something to prevent flash, and this works. This was, uh, after trials, this was determined to have basically the same amount of muzzle flash as a number 4. It then also has a bayonet lug on it. 
Rather than use the same socket style of spike bayonet that the number 4 rifle used, they went back to a sort of a field knife style of bayonet. It's basically the same length, it's about 8 inches long. Um, this is the very early pattern that has a single grip screw on it, and this just snaps on like a standard sort of bayonet. This would be adopted as the number 5 Mark I bayonet, which is actually remarkably easy to remember because it's the same designation as the rifle. And the same thing was true when they first adopted the number 4 Mark I bayonet. Anyway, uh, there would be a slight revision to the bayonet, and virtually all the ones you find will be like this, with two grip screws to better hold on the wooden grip panels. So uh, this didn't change the designation. Still a number 5 Mark I bayonet. Now, moving to the buttstock, a uh, couple things here. It was determined or decided that the sling on the number 5 would only be used for carrying the rifle. On the number 4, the sling swivel was down here, and you could actually use the, the sling as a field expedient shooting aid. Wrap it around your arm and, and get some extra stability. You can't really do that so well when the sling is on the side of the rifle, and that was a conscious decision made on the part of the designers. that. They would rather have the gun easier to carry with a side sling than to be able to use that as a shooting aid. In addition, they stuck a rubber butt pad on the gun. This one uh, is heavily worn, but this is again a trials rifle that's been through quite a lot. Uh, it's a metal butt plate with a rubber, uh, a slightly smaller rubber butt plate, uh, rubber butt pad centered in it, and that's in acknowledgement to the fact that this is a lighter rifle. Uh, it's about a pound and a half lighter than number 4, and it will kick a little bit more uh, than the standard pattern. If we take a look at the markings on the receiver here, it's uh, what distinguishes this as a trials rifle is first off the serial number. So this is notable as a trials rifle in part because of the serial number, which we know that FE prefix is the first thousand rifles that were produced. but in addition, if we look at the receiver markings here, it's actually double marked, because it was originally a number 4 Mark I uh, F, made in December of 1943 there, and then it has been marked over again uh, to the left, number 5 Mark I F, uh, with a production date that is... we can't really make out the month, but it's a 1944 trials gun. So 44 is when the field trials were done, and that, that all fits. Now once we get into production, there are going to be a couple variations on these guns, but really not many. So one of them is the rear sight. This is still the very fine, nicely made, this is the equivalent of the, the early war pattern of number 4 sight. However, note that there is a little a notch cut here, and that's just to improve uh, light transmission into the rear sight there. So that's one pattern. Note that all of these while the body of the sight is the same as a number 4, they're only graduated up to 800 yards instead of the 1300 yards of the full length rifle. Um, they were expecting this rifle, the number 5, to have an effective range of about 400 yards, so the sights going out to 8 was plenty. You don't need to try and mess with it going farther. You will also find the sights like this virtually identical, except we have a larger rear aperture cut here, and you don't have the extra machine cutaway uh, to give a little better light transmission. So virtually identical here. Still the, the big fancy milled sight. Primary difference is a larger aperture. Those were the Mark I, and this is the Mark II style of sight, which is all stamped. So this is roughly equivalent to the Mark III or Mark IV on the standard uh, number 4 Lee Enfields. Uh, instead of being milled, this is all sheet metal stamped. It's cheaper to make, it's quicker to make. Uh, it has this much simplified style of battle sight on it. However, it is still graduated up to 800. So uh, that's probably your biggest functional difference uh, in the during the course of production, and even that's not particularly important. Uh, they all shoot the same way for the, the user. The other difference you will see is in the front end of the stock, and probably the majority of them, the, the preferred pattern appears to have been this, where the wood was just kind of rounded to a stop. It looks like it's just been sporterized by someone, but it's not. The end of the grain was sealed, and it was just left alone like that. The alternative uh, was to actually have a squared off metal end cap like this. You will see both. Um, they're both equally accurate, or equally appropriate, uh, and they were both done in military service. This is a quite late example, uh, manufactured in February of 1947. 
Uh, 47 would be the last year of production, we'll cover that in a minute. Uh, this is produced by Fazakerly, and this is standard sort of typical markings, number 5 mark 1, F means Fazakerly. We have a date of production, and then we have a serial number with a one letter, and eventually, uh, they did keep going after this, they went to a two letter prefix. So there'll be A through Z, and then AA, AB, and so on. These were also manufactured by BSA Shirley, and the markings on those are going to be totally different. They still say number 5 mark 1 up on the top of the receiver, but the rest of the markings are down here on the socket. And, I mean, it makes perfect sense that uh, BSA would be indicated by M47C, or Charlie. Let's see if we can get the light on that a little better. Uh, M47 was the a factory code assigned to BSA, and then BSA had five or six different uh, factories making various things, and so each factory got a letter suffix. So C happens to be the Shirley plant uh, for BSA. So that's why it's M47C. And then we have a date and a serial number. They also used uh, prefix, uh, two-letter prefixes in this case. Um, in fact, here, <laughs> for all the, the work they went to with M47 as a, a code for BSA, the B, the first letter of the serial number is B for BSA, uh, then follows the, uh, the, like the, the batch number, which started at A and went sequentially. So that's what a BSA gun looks like. Now I've got one other really cool one here that I want to show you. You can see the receiver marks are totally different here. Just number 5, and then it's got some experimental nomenclature on it. And that, by the way, this is also a BSA gun. You can see how crude those markings are. That's, that's typical and appropriate. Uh, this happens to be a 1945... Yeah, it's a 1945 production gun. And you may notice it has this screw in the side of the wood, instead of having the sort of little sheet metal tab right there. This is actually a prototype of the number 5 Mark II, which would have been the same modification as the number 4 Mark II. Namely, the trigger was bolted to the receiver instead of bolted to the trigger guard. Uh, we'll touch on that when we talk about, in a future episode, the number 4 Mark II. But I wanted to point it out here. They made a few experimental examples to try the idea out, and then ultimately didn't end up adopting it. They never made this as a production gun. Because frankly, by the time this, the Mark II system was adopted for the number 4 rifle, uh, the number 5 rifle was out of production. So a uh, very rare example here to take a look at. And I should point out, beyond that bolt and this little internal modification, this is otherwise a standard number 5 rifle. It's a really nice condition one, uh, but it is a normal standard number 5. Lastly, there's a vestigial little bit of metal boss down here on the original number 4 that has been milled off on this example. But on an actual number 4, you can see it right there, that was originally uh, there to provide material for mounting the magazine cutoff. The cutoff itself had been removed uh, when the number 4 Mark 1 was adopted, and for the number 5, that was just a little extra bit of metal that was available to be removed. It's worth noting that this being our converted trials rifle, the stock still has a cutout for that little bit, that little metal boss, but the boss itself has been milled off to save weight. Alright, so Wandering Zero. This is the big thing, uh, the spectre kind of hanging over the number 5 rifle. It was discovered, or determined, or collated really, in 1945 that these guns apparently had some problems with Zero. And we're not talking about every individual rifle being a problem, we're talking about a problem on a statistical level. Like, there are way too many reports from armorers who say that they can't get the rifles to properly zero, or that the zeros change over time. And so the British start investigating this. And at first, naturally, they think maybe this is an issue with the, the stocking up, uh, or how the wood is fitted to the metal. And if you know things are too tight or too loose, uh, if the wood is swelling and applying pressure to the barrels, maybe there's some systemic issues with that. Um, they do a bunch of testing, they actually build some rifles that they stock all the way out to the muzzle to test. Comes out inconclusive, they're still getting issues. Uh, some armorers come to the conclusion, or discover, that the accuracy problems that are being reported are basically uh, the same as the problems that were found with number 4 rifles, where the bolt wasn't perfectly square, the bolt face wasn't perfectly square with uh, the back of the chamber. 
and the suspicion becomes that the lightning cuts on the back of the number 5 receiver, which are just behind the locking recesses, the locking lugs, are in fact making the receiver just a little too weak, and it is sometimes flexing upon firing, which is causing the accuracy issues. The ultimate conclusion by the British government is the accuracy problems are, a, are inherent to the rifle design, and they cannot be easily remedied. And this is late 1940s, and you know what? We already know that we really want a self-loading rifle. This is clearly what's going to be the future. So there had been some calls early on, some suggestion that this should replace the number 4 overall, and this should be the new British standard infantry rifle. But that really doesn't make sense. If you already know you're going to go to a self-loading rifle, why? You know, it, it's pointless. It's a waste of money at this point. So. Ultimately, in July of 1947, the rifle number 5 is declared obsolescent, and production ceases by the end of 1947. Now, it's not pulled out of service. It's still a valuable, useful gun. Adoption of the SLR, the FN FAL, is still a number of years away. And so these rifles would in fact see substantial use by the British military. They would see a lot of combat use in the, Mal the Malayan Emergency, 1948 to 1960. Uh, they would be used in Kenya. Uh, between 1952 and 1960, and they really kind of did earn that name, the Jungle Carbine, because they are quite well suited to a jungle environment, more so than the number 4 rifle. So um, ultimately, like from adoption to obsolescence, three years is all that the rifle number 5 lasted. But it is still one of, I think, one of the coolest looking, nicest handling versions of the Lee Enfield. So. Um, if you are interested in more of a hands-on uh, discussion of this rifle, I would suggest you check out the British Muzzleloaders channel. Uh, over there they have a video on a comparison between the number 4 and the number 5 with a bunch of practical shooting um, and some really cool period uniforms. So check that out if you haven't seen it. Hopefully you enjoyed this look at the number 5. Thanks for watching.